preach to. You really are. You're, you're very attentive. You, you seem to listen well. And even if you aren't listening well, I think you are. And uh, so that's, that's half the battle, at least for me. So uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I preach to a wonderful church, Beth Haven Baptist Church in, in Sheridan, Michigan. I'm literally surprised that they have put up with me for these many years. And uh, my dad pastored there for 16 years. And uh, I don't know if this is hope for anybody or not, but I went to Bible college. I got saved when I was seven, surrendered to the Lord when I was 14, was at Bible camp. And I said, God, I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. I was in Bible college and my mom and dad came for a visit. And my mom said, said to me after chapel that day, she said, Kevin, I just want you to know what God's laid on my heart. And I said, what's that? And she said, uh, I'm praying that God will send you as a missionary to Japan. I said, okay. And, uh, and she said, if you don't go to Japan, God is my witness. She said, I'm praying that God will kill you. I said, I feel my mother's love today. <laughs> I don't know if it's because my eyes are a little bit slanted. Maybe she felt that I kind of would fit in with the Asian culture. I'm not sure. I just, she just said, either you go to Japan as a missionary or I'm praying that God will kill you. And I said, wow. I said, I hope God lays that on my heart. Mom, if not, it's been good knowing you these 19 years. <laughs> so I graduated from Bible college and I literally had no clue what God was going to do with me. I worked for a telemarketing company. I worked for True Green for a year and a half. Then I worked for a Miracle for a year and a half. Then I started selling insurance. I, I sold insurance for five years at uh, Fire Bureau Insurance in Crown Point, Indiana. And uh, we were just kind of going through the motions. My wife uh, began teaching at, uh, at a church in Lake Station. And then I was started working with the teens. And I, I thought that's where we would live for the rest of our life. My dad was came down with cancer in 1993. And called me one day there he was in Sheridan and Greenville area and uh, said we need to meet for supper at Benton Harbor that was kind of our go-to place when we needed to get together so we met in Benton Harbor and my dad said Kevin uh, I've got cancer and he said uh, we're gonna do everything we can to fight it but uh, he said it's in the Lord's hands and uh, I didn't really think anything other than the fact that you know I'm just gonna pray for my dad's healing and as his, the, the next three, three and a half years went on, the cancer continually progressed and got worse. He did chemothe chemotherapy, he did radiation. He was doing everything he possibly could. The doctor said he was trying to treat it holistically as well and doing everything. He was going to the Bourne Clinic in Grand Rapids and trying to treat it every way he could. Finally, it came down to February of 1996, and I went to see him in the hospital, and Tim and I had driven up from Lake Station. It was snowing that day, and if you ever drive along Lake Michigan on a snowy day, you do not want to be there. We were driving home from my parents after we got married, and uh, we got along that lake shore, and we, I had to go to work the next day, but we had to stop and pull over at a hotel. The semis were running 60 miles an hour, and traffic was running about five miles an hour, and Tammy was crying in the passenger seat. She said, we're never going to make it home. I said, okay, I'm stopping at the next exit. Stayed in a roach-infested hotel, if you know what I'm talking about, but in that situation, you have, you have no choice. You just have to stay with the only place you can stay, and... Uh, we made home, but anyways, uh, so my, my dad said, Kevin, I, I think you're to be the next pastor of Beth Haven Baptist Church. And I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I said, Dad, I, I think the cancer has went from your kidneys, your lungs, your liver, to your brain. So I said, was I, and he, he looked at me, and, and my dad didn't always laugh at my humor. You know, sometimes he would, sometimes he didn't. And this day, he didn't laugh. And I looked at him, and he had a, a serious look on his face, and I said, you're serious, aren't you? And he said, I'm dead serious. He said, Kevin, I've never heard of dying grace before. But he said, I know what it is now. He said, God's going to take me home. He said, God's going to cure me of my cancer. But he's not going to cure me here. He's going to cure me in heaven. Amen. And he said, I've only asked God for two things. One, that your mom would be taken care of. And he said, I know that you and your brother Jeff will take good care of her. He said, number two, is that I would have a replacement to take over so the church doesn't have to go without a pastor. And I, I literally have never been so caught off guard in my life. So I got home. We talked for several hours that day, probably seven or eight hours. I got home later that night, and uh, my mom said, did your dad talk with you? I said, oh, he sure did. She said, did he tell you what he was supposed to tell you? Yes, he did. And she said, what did you tell him? I said, I told him I'm not ready. And my mom said, you're right. I told him the same thing. <laughs> I said, Norm, he's not ready. I was almost 31 years old. And uh, I said, well, I said, it's two against three. Somehow my dad went out, and uh, for the last almost 28 years, I have been living a dream. It's been just amazing. 
oh, sure, there's struggles along the way, and you're dealing with people. You're going to always deal with issues. I called my secretary this morning. I shouldn't have called her this morning. I should have called her this afternoon. And she said, oh, did you talk to Mr. Moline? He's the high school principal, and no big deal. We had a little issue yesterday. Some lady fell in the parking lot, and it was just, it, you know, how things always kind of just kind of get drung along and strung along. And I said, oh, just here, call the insurance company. Everything should be fine. It's what we have insurance for, praise the Lord. So uh, I just said to myself, there's just never a dull moment. But God has been so good, so gracious. And just it's just been an amazing, amazing adventure. So let me say this. If you're here and you might even be a senior and say, Pastor Carl, I have absolutely no clue what God has for me. That's okay. It's okay. Just stay close to him. And he'll show you in the right time. I promise you, I promise you. I've watched Bible graduates, college graduates go out, start pastoring churches at 24, 25 years of age. And I have thanked God many times that that wasn't me. If I would have come to Beth Haven Baptist Church at the age of 25, I would not be there today. I would not be there today. I mean, I was green at 31. I've got people that have been in that church for the whole time I've been there, that all the way back to when my dad was there. I look at those dear people and I say, it is only the grace of God. I mean, I, I, I've gone back and listened to some of my messages from 28 years ago, and man, I, I was just like an uncaged animal. I'm like, how in the world did anybody put up with that? And they have. They've been just absolutely wonderful. This summer, July 28th, we'll celebrate our 50th year. Our church was started back in 1974, and uh, it's just been an amazing, amazing journey. So whatever God has for you, whenever God has it for you, just be ready, because there's always a prepared place for a prepared person. Just find Luke chapter 4. Follow along as I read. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. The devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, Thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence, from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Heavenly Father, help us as we look into this passage this morning and a few others. Give us not only ears to hear, but give us hearts that would apply what the Holy Spirit would have for us today. I thank you for your word. We know that it's true. I thank you for the fact that we still hold in our hands the King James Bible. It's not just a translation. It is the word of God. I thank you for that. True from the very beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, all the way through the end of the book of Revelation. Thank you for the blessed promise, the wonderful precepts we have. God, I pray that you'd bless us today, meet with us in a special way. Thank you for these young people, the high school students, the college students, and the many adults that are here today. Thank you for bringing us here today. And may we accomplish your will and your purpose. And when all is said and done, may you be the one that gets the edified and glorified. And may we say thank you in advance for all that you're going to do this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach on maybe on an interesting topic in a, in, a, in a chapel service, but I want to preach on this thought of overcoming temptation. I'm going to give you some thoughts on temptation, and I'm going to give you some, some steps on overcoming temptation. So if you want to take notes this morning, um, the first part of it might be a little hurried, but uh, then I've got 10 points. Most of my messages have three to five. This one, I've got 10. I've actually got 10 for my message tonight as well. I guess 10 is just the right number today. But uh, let me just give you just some basic thoughts on temptation. Number one, if you don't overcome temptation, temptation will overcome you. I'm convinced we will never be spiritual enough to avoid being tempted. We are not all tempted by the same things. But we are all tempted. Temptation promises pleasure, but delivers pain. There are no shortcuts to overcoming temptation. Never underestimate the power of temptation. Every time we say yes to a temptation, we make it that much harder to say no. When you develop an appetite for that which is bad, you will soon lose your appetite for that 
which is good. I want to give you some thoughts this morning on overcoming temptation. Before I get there, if you're still in Luke chapter 4, I want you to look at verse number 12. The Bible said, when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him. Well, look at those last three words. For a season. Now, this is amazing to me. The Bible says, where was that at? In verse number two, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So Jesus was fasting for this 40-day process of time. He was being tempted for these 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, the Bible gives us three specific temptations that, that the devil threw at the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's amazing to me is after the devil realized after 40 days of temptation, he accomplished nothing. He, he, he got nowhere. He was unsuccessful in his attempt to try to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the Bible said that when he departed from him, he departed for a season. It's as if he said, I'll be back. I didn't get you today, but I'm going to get you another day. I'm coming at you again. You might have been successful today, but I'm going to wait until you're at a, a weaker point. How could somebody be at a weaker point than after having fasted for 40 days? But the devil said, I'm, I'll be back. I think I've heard that phrase more than once in my mind. When the devil brings a temptation my way, it seems like, okay, Kevin, I might have not got you today, but I'll be back. I want to say 10 things quickly, so if you want to write notes, this is where I'd start writing notes. You say, Pastor Carl, how is it possible in the year 2024 to overcome temptation? Well, I'm going to start with this. Number one, respond with Scripture. Jesus responded this way in chapter 4 and verse 4 of the book of Luke. The Bible says, and he answered and said, it is is written. Verse number eight, Jesus said, it is written. Verse number 12, Jesus said, it is said. If you say, Pastor Crow, I, I, I feel the devil coming my way, and I know when temptation comes and settles in my heart, settles in my mind, Pastor Crow, what where do I start? What do I do when temptation comes my way? You better be ready to respond with scripture. Whatever the devil has, respond with the word of God. My Bible says in James chapter four and verse seven, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. It doesn't tell us to resist the devil until we first have submitted to God. How do we submit to God? Right here. It is written. When I got up this morning, I, I, I started writing up some notes for this morning. I started saying a little bit, and uh, I, I got a little carried away. Sometimes I, I get in that study mode, and when thoughts are flowing, I just start writing. And it seemed like I got a little ways with the Ramus, and the Holy Spirit said, Whoa! What about you? You better stop right now, and you better open your Bible, and you better read some chapters, because it's not just about preaching to them today. It's about letting me speak to you today. So I want you to just quiet your heart, put your pen down, and just open the book and start reading. Because before you're going to have the ability to resist the devil, you're first going to have to submit to me. One of the best things that my dad ever did when I was a kid, and I... We don't have it today, but we have, we have a different children's program. We had a children's program called Awan, as a proved workman are not ashamed. And one of the things that Awan has did for me is it gave me the desire to memorize Scripture. Now, can I say this? You are doing yourself a disservice if you don't memorize every bit of Scripture you can. Because when you get my age, Brother Goss, it doesn't get easier to memorize Scripture, does it? I'll look, at a, I'll look at a scripture and I'll write it on a three by five card and I'll read it and read it and read it and read it. And I'll, I'm like, what's happened? <laughs> the, the mind that I had, I used, it just used to absorb things like a sponge. What's happened to it? You know what the Holy Spirit said? Oh no, you can still memorize, you can still memorize. You just have to work a little harder. But can I say this? There is nothing worth memorizing in this book right here. And if you want to overcome temptation, it's going to start when we rely and we respond with Scripture. Number two, oh, remember to watch and pray. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, he said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Listen to this. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is. Can I say this? Regardless of how spiritual you are today, 
how spiritual you might feel today and where you might seem to be on that spiritual plane, can I say this? Your flesh is still weak. Your flesh will be weak tomorrow. Your flesh will be weak on Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And I promise you this, every time you try to rely on the flesh, it will fail you because it is always weak. So you better mark it down. If you're going to overcome temptation, you better watch and pray. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He said, it's not just a fun and game time. It's not just to see, oh, I wonder what I can get away with today and how far I can go tomorrow and how close I can get to the boundaries tomorrow and if I can get away with this or if I can get away with that. No, no, it's not a game time. You understand, the devil is not looking to entertain you today. Right. He's wanting to destroy you. My Bible said the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's not here just to entertain you with social media or TikTok or Instagram. He's not here just to entertain your mind with movies and music and media. He is here literally to destroy you. He knows the potential you have for God. He knows the desire that's in your heart this morning to serve God. He knows the ability you have when you speak with people and share the gospel with people. He understands that. His goal is not for you to have a good time. His goal is for you to be destroyed. Sorry if I get a little preachy. Number three, remember God's way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there hath no... Temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And don't forget this next phrase, but God is faithful, who will not suffer to be tempted above the area, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Can I say this? I have heard far too many people say, Pastor Curl, like, I, I got this temptation came my way, and I just, I never saw God's way of escape. And I, I've tried to tell people on more than one occasion, can I say this? Sometimes God, God's way of escape comes before the temptation comes. If you've been tempted in a particular area before, don't be surprised if the devil tries to tri trick you in that same area again. And if you opened a door, if you allowed the devil to come into a certain area of your life, you better close that off and you better say, this is off limits to the devil. I'm not going to allow him to tempt me here. And so many times they think, well, I got away with it yesterday and I didn't really sin. And I got away with it last week and I didn't really sin. But you just wait. The devil's waiting. He's setting you up. Sometimes he'll let us succeed because he's setting us up for even a greater failure. He is so much smarter than we give him credit for. You understand, he's been tracking human nature for 6,000 years. When the Bible says there's no temptation that, that, but is common to man, you think what you're being tempted with is just, is just unique to you? Oh, no, the devil's been using that for years. I've said this on many occasions. He knows when to attack. He knows how to attack. He's always ready to attack. And I promise you, my Bible says, but he's looking and he's walking about, and he's seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying if you're going to overcome temptation, you better learn to respond with Scripture. You better remember to watch and pray, to remember God's way of escape. Can I say this? You better refuse to give place to the devil. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. That word place in this context is referring to land. And if you give the devil a foothold in your life, here's what he's going to do. He's going to build a stronghold. Here's what happens. He oftentimes starts out small. Now, we don't think it's really that big of a deal. It's kind of almost like Samson. Samson said, hey, wrap me up with seven green whisks. I got this. Wrap me up with new ropes. No big deal. Weave the seven locks of my beam. I got that. No big deal. He said, I'll just go at it other times. Finally, she cuts his hair. He says, no big deal. I've got this. I'm three for three. After his fourth little game with Delilah, he was still three for four. He still was more successful than he was as a failure. And what did it do? It destroyed his life. See how good the devil is? 
Samson already had a, a desire to kind of play games. You know, he had the, the wedding and he had the riddle. And, you know, then he said, what'd you do? You've been plowing in my heifer. And I don't know that's good language to refer to your wife. But, um, you know, and so he goes out and kills 30 Philistines and gives them 30 changes of garments. He's kind of a, just a, a fun kind of guy. And, hey, there's nothing wrong with being a fun kind of guy. Just make sure that you stay within the boundaries of this book. And don't allow yourself to get drawn in the wrong direction and say, oh, Pastor Kroll, I've been tempted here, no biggie. Been tempted there, no biggie. Just wait. Eventually, there's a big one around the corner somewhere. And you're going to look back and say, why didn't I listen? Proverbs chapter 5. Why didn't I listen to those that instructed me? Pastor Kroll, what are you saying? I'm saying we better respond with Scripture. We better remember to watch and pray to remember God's way of escape. To remember and to refuse to give place to the devil. Number five, recognize your lusts. In James chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away, listen to this, of his own lust and enticed. I said a minute ago that we're not all tempted by the same things, but we're all tempted. You say, Mr. what are we tempted by? We're tempted by whatever our wrong desires are. Whatever those lusts in our heart or lusts in our mind, that's what we're going to be tempted. The devil is so good. He knows our weaknesses, and he's going to set us up where he believes he can be most successful. I said a minute ago, the last 28 years have been the greatest years of my life, and what a blessing it's been to be in the ministry. But can I say this? One of the heartaches and one of the heartbreaks of the ministry is when the devil comes and snatches a precious soul. And a young person that was on fire for God or even maybe an older person was on fire for God and all of a sudden the devil gets them distracted and the devil gets them deceived and he gets them sideways with God and sideways with the word of God and sideways with the preacher and all of a sudden these temptations come flowing so fast and the next thing you know they have literally destroyed their life, their testimony, their family and you say how in the world could that happen? Because they weren't ready when temptation came. Number next, if possible, remove the temptation. Romans chapter 13, 14 says, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Years ago, we had a, a, a teen revival. And on Friday night, the evangelist said, we're going to have a we're going to have a burning pit, and we're going to have a, a big fire going, and everybody's got some stuff that we need to throw in the fire. We're going to do that. And then he said, we're going to have a big barrel on the other side for things that won't burn. And uh, he said, you know, just bring it in a paper sack. We don't need to see what it is. We need to know what it is. We've got <clears throat> books, magazines, videos, video games, whatever you got. Just put it in a bag, and we'll throw it in the fire, and we'll just let it burn. And I was, I was, how do I say this? Pastor Mitchell, I was kind of excited, but not at the same time when I saw this long line of teenagers lined up. I said, well, I mean, I guess it's time to get rid of this stuff. But I'm like, how'd they have it in the first place? You know what I'm saying? Well, we're here. Let's get rid of it. So they're all lined up, and teenagers would come to the microphone and say, as preacher was preaching this week, I've got some things I've been holding on to that God doesn't want me to have in my life. And they'd take that bag, and they'd throw down that fire, and teenagers were clapping, and, you know, saying amen, praise the Lord, and got all the way down. And there was one of our teenagers that was the end of that row. And he was holding a stereo in his hand. And I thought, I don't think that's going to burn, to be honest with you. It might have to go in the barrel. And he was kind of one of our shyer young men and didn't really speak out a lot, but he was a good kid. Just a, had a really good heart. And so all these kids went through, and he was the very last guy. He came up to the microphone, and it was a Friday night. And he said, I, I went home from work or from school yesterday. And then he said, I went to my, my part-time job for a couple hours and came back for the service last night. And he said, when I, when I pulled out of the school parking lot, he said, I, I just felt the temptation to listen to some wrong music. I said, no, no. He said, I got to my job and I got back in the truck and I had that same temptation to listen to some wrong music. And he said, I, I, I went home and he said, I got back on my way to church. And he said, I had that same temptation. So he said, I went from school today. And he said, I <clears throat> went in my dad's little toolbox and I grabbed some of my dad's tools. And he said, I ripped the stereo out of my truck. And he said, here it is. And he said, now I'm hoping when I get back in the truck, I don't have to worry about having the temptation to listen to the wrong kind of music because here's my stereo. And he threw it in the trash can. I had to be over 15 years ago to this day. 
That man is faithfully serving Amen. at Beth Haven Baptist Church. His wife is faithfully serving beside him. His children have smiles on their faces when they come to church. And I've looked back on that day, Brother Mitchell, so many times and said, I wonder if God was just saying, young man, what are you going to do with the temptation? You're going to let that music destroy your life? Because that's what music will do. You, you understand that. I don't care how cool the lyrics are. I don't care how cool the melody is and the rhythm. I don't, I don't care about any of that. He is so good at getting in your head. And once he does, all he wants to do, he doesn't want to entertain you. He wants to destroy you. Don't ever forget that. Number next. Oh, where are we at here? Number seven. Remove every wrong thought. Second Corinthians chapter five says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Listen to this. And bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You, you, know, you, you know where the devil is going to attack you? I'll tell you where he's going to attack you. He's going to attack you right here. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 23. He said, but I see another law in my members. Listen to this. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul said, I see another. He said, there's this, this thing warring against the law of my mind and it's trying to bring me into captivity to the law of sin. Can I say this quickly? And I'm running out of time. But the problem with our mind, you know what our problem with our mind is? It's the devil's battleground. Amen. The devil is going to win his battle the moment he wins your mind. We can be sitting in a chapel service like this and we can have our Bibles in front of us. We can sing the wondrous hymns we just sang and your minds can be in a cesspool this morning. You can have a suit and tie on. You can have a good haircut. Ladies, you can be modest, and I appreciate that. I applaud that. But can I say this? We've got to be so careful because our mind is the devil's battleground. That's what he's after. If he can control your mind, he can control you. It's the problem with our mind. So Paul said there's a purging that has to take place. He said, you've got to take every thought and bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, when that first wrong thought steps in, that's when you clean your mind. He said it this way in Romans 12 too, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove it is that good and acceptable and perfect of God. One of the best definitions I like for that word renew is to implant holy affections in the heart. We've got to get the junk out and get the holiness of God in. See, there's a problem. There's a purging. But, oh, can I say this? There's a protection for our mind. Paul put it this way in Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Can I say this? Don't tell me your thoughts don't matter. Your thoughts do matter. What you think about is who you're in the process of becoming if you're not already there. Pastor Crow, what, what are you saying this morning? I'm saying this. You better remind yourself this morning, if we're going to overcome temptation, we have got to remove every wrong thought. I've got to quickly get through these next two. Number eight, restrain your flesh. One of the best words you'll ever learn to say. You ready for this? No. Not to your parents, not to your teachers, not to the authority at Fairing Baptist College or Fairing Baptist Academy, but to the devil, to the flesh. I'm an evangelist friend of mine. He claims that he gets up every morning. He's got a big, big mirror next to his bed. And he says he gets up every morning. And the first thing he does when he looks in the mirror, it says, no, no flesh you won't win today. No devil you won't win today. And he said the first words out of his mouth every morning are these simple words. No, not today. No. Might want to practice that sometime. <laughs> Number nine, reconsider your relationships. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10 says, My son, anyone? If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Can I say this? You might want to reconsider your relationships because you'd be surprised. Sometimes temptations don't just come from the devil. Sometimes they come from your roommates. Hello? Sometimes they come from your Christian friends in the Christian school. Sometimes they come from sources that you would least expect it. I'm not saying this braggadociously, but I've got pastors 
that are no longer my pastor friends. Because every time they call me, you know what they want to do? They want to run this pastor down. They want to run this ministry down. They want to run that. Oh, did you hear what this pastor did? Oh, did you hear what this pastor did? hear what this man just said? I was talking to a guy not long ago, and I said, sir, can I just be honest with you? My plate is full. I have enough going on at 1158 West Carson City Road in Sheridan, Michigan, let alone with me. I don't have time to try to straighten out every other pastor and ministry in America. I've got enough to deal with right here. These guys, they just want to talk about this guy. No, 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 no. Do you know what that is to me? It's a source of temptation. You get caught into that critical spirit, get caught into gossiping, and I just call it garbage collecting. Man, who wants to carry that around? I mean, if you, you know, if you work for, uh, I guess our, our, our waste company is called Republic. If you work for Republic, then I guess you can be a garbage collector. But if you don't work for Republic, let the garbage go. I don't know about you, but the garbage around the house has to sit around there for a couple days. It begins to stink. And it'll do the same thing in your life and in mine. I got one last one. Can you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please? Brother Schrock, I apologize, my friend. I told you I'd be done at 11.45. Can I have five more minutes? I just, I just have one last thought. Here's my 10th point. Repent and recover. Look at verse number 24 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. And meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And don't miss this next phrase. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, semicolon, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Do you know what saddens me this morning, Brother Amos? I believe there are many Christians today who have been taken captive by the devil. Listen to this. According to the Bible, at his will. You ever seen those little puppets that, uh, that are on, 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 on like four different strings? And you can kind of control them and you can lift their arms and lift their legs, you know, and, and you're, you're kind of in control of that. I, I, when I read this verse, that's what I picture in my mind. A Christian that's on these strings and the devil's pulling the strings and the Christian does exactly whatever the devil wants him to do. Let's go back to look at that verse number 24 or 25 once again. In meekness... Instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Can I just share this thought with you quickly? I think oftentimes we misunderstand the doctrine of repentance. In this verse, the Bible says if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You know what the word peradventure means? It means by chance. If, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought, I thought that repentance is on my terms, and if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, 1 John 1, 9 is still true. But can I say this? I think we've gotten it all wrong. Forgive me for this illustration, but sometimes we treat God like he's a genie in a bottle. And we rub that lamp, and he pops out and says, I, I, I'll give you three wishes, grant what you want. And it's on our terms. No. No. Repentance is on his terms. Here's my example. Several years ago, I had a gentleman in my church, still comes to church, was there this past Sunday morning. His name's Paul. Paul, I think, is 75 years old. Paul came out on a Sunday morning several years ago, probably almost 10 years ago, and he said, Pastor Crow, and he, and he opened, he had a suit on, and he opened his pocket like this, and he had a pack of cigarettes right here in his front pocket. He pulled that pack of cigarettes out, and he said, Pastor Crowley said, I've got three cigarettes left in this pack. And he said, here's what God told me to do this morning. God said, Paul, you're done smoking as of right now. I didn't preach on smoking. I didn't preach on smoking, but the Holy Spirit did. You know what I'm saying? See, the Holy Spirit isn't limited to me. He's probably preached more messages this morning than we could even keep track of this morning. He said, in fact, he said, Pastor, I don't even remember what you preached this morning, but I know what the Holy Spirit preached. Paul, stop smoking. Paul, stop smoking. So he said, I'm going home. And I was afraid he was going to say, I'm going to smoke these last cigarettes and I'm done. You know what I'm saying? 
I know I'm done, but give me three more, God. Three more cancer sticks, please. Three more. You know how much these cigarettes cost? I just, I can't afford to just throw them away. No, no. He said, Pastor, I'm going home. I'm, I'm throwing them all away. And he said, I'm done. God told me, Paul, you're done today. A few months ago, he and his wife, Sharon, are always the first ones to church. I'm Austin. They're sitting in the back, and I was walking through the auditorium making sure that the temperature was set right, and I, I saw Paul sitting in the back, and I said, hey, Paul, can I ask you a question? He said, Pastor, ask me anything you want. I said, when's the last cigarette you smoked? And he looked at me, and he said, Pastor Kroll, it's been almost 10 years ago. We said, Pastor, it's even better than that. He said, I haven't wanted a cigarette in the last 10 years. Now, we've had an addictions program at our church for over 20 years. I've talked to drug addicts. I've talked to alcoholics. You name it, I've talked to them. And I have, to have, I, I have yet to have anybody tell me that there was a harder addiction to break than cigarettes. I've never ever talked to this pastor girl. I gave up drinking, gave up drugs, gave all, but the hardest one, the last one I've ever given up or haven't given up is cigarettes. Paul smoked three packs a day for 40 years. That's 60 cigarettes a day. That's a lot. I mean, one's a lot, but 60 is a whole lot. This guy just. Oh, no, it gets worse than that. I was in Grand Rapids making a hospital visit a few weeks ago. Got to the corner. Gentleman had a hole in his throat. No doubt due to cancer. He was standing outside of the hospital, had a hospital gown on. He was standing outside and had a cigarette up to that hole in his throat going. <laughs> See, that's what the devil wants. There goes my throat. <clears> throat> Do you know what Paul did that day? Paul was given repentance by the Holy Spirit of God. He acknowledged the truth. And said, God, I better give up these cigarettes and I better give them up today. And because he listened and God granted him, God gave him repentance that day for the last 10 years. He's been cigarette free. Something that was chained to him for 40 years. Pastor, what is here? Here's what I'm saying. I got to quit. You might have a sin, a temptation in your life and say, Pastor Crow, I'm not ready to give it up. Well, if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit of God, listen to this. You may never, ever give it up. Do you know how many people I've watched try to walk away from drugs and alcohol and cigarettes? We had a lady in our church, precious lady. And she, she, was, she was so sarcastic. I just, I love those sarcastic old ladies. She'd say, I don't know when we're ever going to get another preacher, but when we do, he's going to preach a whole lot shorter than you do. She said, I can tell you, in fact, I burnt my roast, and how many times my, my dinners have been burned, and she said, my family comes over, and it's smoking out of the oven. Why do you have to preach so long every week? I just love them. Charges me up. She died. At her funeral, her granddaughter came up to my wife. And she said, Mr. Girl, I have a question for you. She said, did you know that my grandmother smoked? She said, my family just told me that my grandmother was a closet smoker. She said, I've never known my grandmother ever smoked in her life. And my wife said, oh, yeah, I've known that for years. And she said, did she ever try to quit? Oh, yeah, many times. Problem was... She didn't want to do it when God told her to do it. That's okay. You, want to, you don't want to quit on my terms? Go ahead. Have it your way. And let your daughter, granddaughter find out at her funeral that her grandmother that she loved and adored and respected hid cigarettes from her granddaughter for her whole life because she was so embarrassed that she held that habit from her own granddaughter. I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you better be willing and ready to listen because when you don't, my Bible doesn't say God's granted to give you repentance when you want it. My Bible says he'll give it when he wants it. There's been times in my life where I have said no to the Holy Spirit of God. And Brother Rodney, I've had to come back to God and say, God, would you please, would you please erase that? No, that I said to you, and would you please 
grant me repentance so I can get over that, not because of my willingness, but because of my stubbornness and my, my unwillingness to listen to you. God, would you please, would you grant me repentance? I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to mess with this anymore. I was in my, my room this morning and I said, God, if there's a sin that I've been holding on to, would you reveal it to me? And if today is my day of repentance, would you grant it to me so I can get on my knees and say, God, I don't want this sin to destroy my life. My Bible said, if God, peradventure, will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Oh, young people, can I beg with you this morning? If there's something in your life, you better beg and plead and say, God, would today be your day of repentance? And when I talked with Paul Holiday the other day and he said to me, Pastor Crow, it's been almost 10 years. I said, because God granted him repentance. He didn't remember, Brother Schrock, the message Pastor Crow preached that day. He didn't need to. He got orders from headquarters that day. Pinpointed him in that pew and tapped on his shoulder and said, Hey, Paul, don't worry about Pastor Crow this morning. You just listen to me. Give up smoking. You know those cigarettes right there? Those are your last cigarettes. You've smoked your last one. I know, there's three in there. God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We're going to get rid of them. Just think of the Trinity. The cigarettes are gone. You've smoked your last one, Paul. You don't quit today. You may never quit to the day you die. Paul said, preacher, I gave him up. I don't know why the man's not on oxygen. I don't know why the man doesn't live in an oxygen tent, having smoked four or 40 years, three packs a day. I'm just going to say this. When God said, Paul, here's repentance, do you want it or not? It's yours for the asking, Paul. You take those cigarettes and you give them to me, I will take every desire, I will take every craving that your body has for nicotine, and I will remove it as far as the east is from the west. Paul, you better listen to me. 65 years old. You know what happens the older we get? We get more stubborn in our old age. Oh, by the grace of God, Paul said, God, they're yours. I'm going to show them to the preacher on my way out. And I'm going to tell them, I'm throwing them away as soon as I get home. I almost wanted to take them from him. You know what I'm saying? Just give them to me. Let me do it. <laughs> but Paul had to do that. Paul had to be the one to make that choice. And 10 years later, he hasn't smoked another cigarette. Because not only did he repent, but he recovered himself out of the snare of the devil who had taken him captive at his will. Heavenly Father, help us today. God, please, may we listen today. God, please, may we take heed today. Precious lives in front of us this morning. <clears throat> Temptation sometimes almost seems like a game. Oh, but it's not a game. The devil's not looking at a generation that he can entertain. He's looking at a generation that he can destroy. Oh, God, may we find repentance today. If there's an area in our life we've been just kind of playing around with temptation, been allowing temptation to linger around, may we hit an altar today and say, God, would you grant me repentance today? God, I'm, I'm begging for repentance. God, I'm begging for you to meet with me, and I'm begging for you to take this temptation and remove it as far away from me as the east is from the west. May we not stubbornly say, oh, I'll, I'll deal with that sin when I'm ready to get done with it. We may not get done with that sin till that sin is done with us. And God, I've watched that way, way, way too many times. Help us today to humbly come before you and say, God, I need help today. Would you give me repentance and let me leave that sin, leave that temptation behind? In Jesus' name.